A Journey into Infinity with Roger Penrose, read by Caroline Wiseman, as part of Alive in the Universe. Susie Penrose and I are on a train to Oxford to meet her cousin, Professor Sir Roger Penrose, O.M., one of the world's most eminent physicists. The Penrose family are extraordinary, for they split nearly neatly into two. There is the arty side to which Susie belongs, as did her father's uncle Roland, Roger's uncle. And there is the academic side to which Roger belongs. Over our mugs of British Rail coffee, Susie and I analyse this fascinating family of hers. Sir Roland Penrose, married to the celebrated war photographer Lee Miller, knighted for services to art, was Picasso's earliest supporter in the UK. His nephew, the Einstein medalist Sir Roger Penrose, is famous for his work with Stephen Hawking on black holes. He was knighted for services to science and is now taking his lifelong interest in the universe forward with research into the physics of consciousness, which is so intertwined with creative thinking, the key ingredient of the success of the Penrose's double heroes, Picasso and Einstein. An hour later, on this freezing and raining December day, we three are warm and cosy in Oxford's glamorous Ivy restaurant. Susie and I are enchanted with this nearly 90 year old who has joined us. Here we are in space time, is my small talk. But, he confides, there is something about the Big Bang which has worried me for some years. At my age, I could sit and watch TV, but there are still problems about the origin of the universe to be solved. Susie and I are sitting round the table, hanging on to Roger's every word. The problem, he says, is why was there such an imbalance of entropy in the Big Bang? It's the mammoth in the room, we join in. We order our food. So I hit upon an idea, he says. We eat, he talks, and we listen hard. He says something like this. Instead of a beginning and an end of the universe, there are cycles, which I call aeons, which in overall structure repeat over and over again within one continuing universe. We are eating our delicious pan-fried sea bass and listening very hard. As the universe expands, he continues, and gets colder and colder. So photons, tiny particles of energy of light with no mass, therefore no space and no time, and thus no sense of scale, forget how big or small they are. So in this remote future, big and cold, the dying of the universe, being inhabited only by massless entities, is physically equivalent to small and hot at the Big Bang, it's beginning. When there is no mass, he says, big and cold equals small and hot. Susie and I join in. Big and cold equals small and hot. So you see, there is a symmetry which glues the end of the universe with the next Big Bang. We are handed menus. We peruse them while he continues According to work with Polish and Korean colleagues, we claim that certain observational evidence with a 99.98% confidence level seems strikingly to support the picture I am presenting. But that's amazing, I say. Your theory overturns nearly everything we thought about the universe. Well, we can see these photons in the hawking points of radiation in the sky. My crazy idea solves the second law of thermodynamics problem. Why the entropy in gravity specifically was so low at the Big Bang. But right now we have another big problem to solve. Which pudding to choose? Roger is worried that he should have chosen the chocolate bomb. For Susie, chocolate is the closest thing to God. She and I are trying to tease out of Roger his thoughts on God, on the meaning of the universe. Is it all meaningless chance? There is something much deeper about it, 
he has said in the past, but not that lunchtime, even though we gently pressed. There is room for free will, he says, for our consciousness is not algorithmic like a computer. We can make real choices about life. He exercises his free will and chooses the creme brulee. Computers might be clever, but they have no understanding, no awareness. Yes, no feeling. That's a good word, he agrees with Susie. He shares his interest in human consciousness with his uncle Roland, who promoted the surrealist art movement in this country. And Roger possesses the, uh, the Penrose artistic streak too, for he visualises his physics ideas and draws them. Indeed, it was the Dutch artist M.C. Escher's drawing of demons and angels repeating into infinity, which he first saw as an undergraduate, which inspired the revolutionary, revolutionary cosmic idea he is explaining to us. Photons travel at the speed of light right through infinity, just as angels and devils do at the infinity edge of an Escher drawing. What is infinity like? Susie asks her cousin. Interminable tedium, I should think, he replies and laughs. And we all laugh because he is so lovable. Come with me and I'll show you infinity, he might have said. But I think he actually said, would you like to see the Penrose tiling? Roger discovered a tiling pattern which goes on and on ad infinitum without repeating. We walk, Susie and I in high heels, following Roger as he walked on and on through rain and wind through the streets of Oxford. The Penrose tiling is spectacular and also there inside the Mathematical Institute in the Andrew Wiles building are his drawings, each one a beautiful representation of a physics proposition. But when I return to London after our magical day, I realise I need to rethink my thoughts about being alive in the universe. The Big Bang, the beginning of time, forcing on each of us the challenge of life inside space-time, when death by thermal equilibrium, the end of time, offers an explanation to life, one which is intuited, I suggest, by Abrahamic religions. But conversely and interestingly, Roger's physics theory of cosmic cycles is intuited by many Eastern and indigenous religions and has been over the millennia as the cycles of time, birth and rebirth. Back in Aldborough, swimming in the North Sea, I contrast my life with that of the little photon, who unlike me has no mass, has no idea of space or time, who living in the remote future has forgotten if she is big or small and travels at the speed of light right through infinity to become part of the next Big Bang. My mass will rot. Hers has converted into energy and she will live forever as this little packet of energy. Maybe a little bit of the collective conscious, including me, is inside her somewhere in her extraordinary quantum mechanical makeup. Roger is concerned that the mystery of human consciousness, which goes, he believes, to the heart of what the universe is made of, can't be explained by known physics. Roger may never get time to watch television, for he is still leading important research to get closer to an answer. But maybe, with my little photon fantasy, I am guilty of trying to make physics romantic, exactly what I accuse religions of, and as I was by Roger when I wondered if we might each help the universe through our intense creativity hold back the increasing disorder which brings the end of time. For this gives purpose to life, I thought. But now, if the universe is everlasting, might I be part of a meaningless, unceasing flow of events? As I swim, I begin to feel a new sense of being alive in the universe. Roger's theory allows, I read, information transfer between aeons, and this gives me hope that my ideas, the manifestation of my consciousness, will live on through my little photon alter ego, my immortal soul even, as she oscillates through infinity into the next aeon 
and the next forever and ever. Maybe I am romantic, imagining stories to help me understand the laws of physics happening inside me, just as human beings have done since time immemorial. That was A Journey into Infinity with Roger Penrose, read by Caroline Wiseman.